Patricia Talks. Welcome to Patricia Talks, the show where you get to hear stories from everyday people about their extraordinary lives, from authors to sports personalities, TV personalities and entrepreneurs. Welcome to Patricia Talks, or I should really say Norman Mitchell MBE. So welcome to Patricia Talks. How Thanks. are you? I am fine. You're fine. Well, Norman, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to have you in the studio today. I'm very excited to hear about your journey coming to the UK. So why don't you start by telling us which country are you from? I'm from Jamaica. You're from Jamaica. What part of Jamaica? Clarendon. Clarendon, Jamaica. So tell us, Norman, what was life like in Jamaica before you came to the UK? Beautiful garden country. A country that have a lot of fruits and vegetable and name it any kind of fruits that you would like just take a walk down there <laughs> i love it i like that i like that so lots of fruits a beautiful country uh, you lived in clarendon and you absolutely loved your time there so what was it like as a young person growing up in clarendon jamaica oh our growing up days was fine we have great enjoyment. Although we did not have toys, but we had a lot of fun because coming from schools in the evenings, we rush down the field, we get a pineapple, we have guava, we have rose apples, we have the coconut, and we have everything that you can think of to go on with. Nice, you had lots of fun after school. So Norman, uh, unfortunately for you, your dad died when you were just 14 years old. What did that mean for you and the family? It was a result. But thinking of my mother, although I was young, I take up the responsibility to see that she is all right. My providing the food, the wood, the water, and um, whatsoever she needs. So that's quite a lot of responsibility for it, a 14 year old. It was, but I did not look back on that. I look back on my mother, <laughs> one that I really love. And she was a lovely lady. <laughs> So she must have really appreciated all the hard work that you did at such a young age. Well, she did show it by loving little Norman. <laughs> loving little Norman. I love that too. I like that. But Norman, when uh, you grew up and became a young man, a young adult, uh, you made a big decision to come to the UK. Tell me about that. Well... I was with my mother till I was 27 years old and then I decided to make a breakout. I was part of this church and then I went out on the field and as a superintendent and president for young people's service and I stayed out there until I think I was coming up to age to have someone with me. Are you talking about relationship? Norman? Yes. So you decided to enter into a relationship, is I, that right? I get um, engaged and then I got married in 1950 and was still out on the field. So after we began to have children, I said, well, the churches in those days, they were not able to look after their workers as we should. Mm. So when 
England opened up. Then I decided to take a trip, and that's why I'm here. So Norman, you're saying um, England opened up and there was an opportunity for you to come here. What had you heard about England? What had you heard about England before you came here? What was it that made you decide that you would travel? Well, when we was at school as children, we used to, to learn that England streets are paved with gold and London is built upon the Thames. So that was a big interest of coming to see the street paved with gold. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. So you thought you really thought that the streets were paved with gold? <laughs> we well, we get that in history. Okay. So you were told the streets were paved with gold. You were told that London was built on on the Thames. Uh, and so you wanted to come and find some of that gold, right? That's right. <laughs> so tell us now, fast forward, uh, what was it like when you came to the UK? How did you arrive and where did you well, first land? It was quite different when I came to UK because we came in five o'clock on a Sunday morning and the boat did not come straight to the dock because it was a very large boat. It docked out in the sea and a ferry boat should come to take us off. The ferry boat said they won't pay to take us out. But the men from Kingston, they stand up on their feet and they said, we are not going to pay no more money because we have already paid our fare to London. So they never take us off the boat until two o'clock. So when we came off two o'clock, there was three trains waiting for us. And um, after catch the train from Plymouth, mm -hmm. On my way coming up and looking through the window, I see these large chimneys pat up on the top of And I was wondering why they have so many boiling houses here. Boiling houses, <laughs> like factory houses. You thought That's factory, factory houses. yes. Yeah. Boiling houses where we make sugar. So that's the only place we used to see chimney. So I said, why they are having so many chimney in this country? And then I got over Paddington at 10 o'clock. Then I finally begin to shake a little, but I didn't know what, why I was shaking. I didn't remember, I realized that I am into a cold country. So when we got home the night, I saw this great big fire inside the front room. I was a bit astonished and begins to wonder why they are having such a big fire inside the house. Then I realized I was in a cold country, so it, that the place is cold, so that's why they have the fire. So you've <laughs> arrived at Plymouth, you've paid your fate, fare to get here, yourself and all of the other men from Kingston refused to pay any more money to go onto the ferry. How much had you paid in the first place? What was your fare to the UK? My fare was £75 from Jamaica. So Dad, can you tell me uh, what it was like um, to find housing and accommodation? What was it like when you first came to the UK? It was a little difficult in those days to find because when you see a notice put out on a notice board or on a tree or somewhere, you will, the first thing you'll see, you'll see no Irish, no black, no dogs. So you are timid if you to go and knock on the door to ask if there is a vacant or any room to rent. Because, because the sign said it, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Because there was no, on the notice board, no black, no Irish, no dogs. <laughs> wow. So Norman, when you did find accommodation though, um, I understand that there wasn't lots of space. Tell us what that was like. <laughs> the space was very, very, I had a bed, <laughs> and my bed, my bed that I had, when I lay down in it, 
If I'm deterred, I have to get up and <laughs> So, are you saying the bed was so small? <laughs> yes, it, it was narrow. <laughs> if I turned, if I tried to turn on the bed, I fell off. <laughs> wow. So, so had I had to sit up and turn and then lay down again. <laughs> Wow. So you had a very small bed. What about how many other people were occupying the space? Well, in that room, it was seven of us. Seven? Seven people. Seven men. Seven men? Yes. In one room? Three and one bed, three and one, and I was on a little one. <laughs> so sometimes there were three people to any one bed? Three people, yeah. <laughs> and were these people that you knew? Were they people that you travelled with, or were they just people? No, no, met? no, no. They are people that travel on their own different time. So you were basically bedding down but, with strangers? But um, when they hear about a, a space, they try to get it. Mm. At those days, you couldn't ask for a room. You had to ask if there's any space in. Wow. So what were the facilities like then? It was very tough. But the one thing, the men were jolly at it. They didn't first they didn't worry they didn't bother everybody no wall no wall drove was in the room no dressing table we had to keep our case underneath the bed with all your clothes in <laughs> yeah what about what about things like kitchen cooking facilities oh, bathing facilities kitchen. what was that like when when the west indians begin to get their own place, see? They, they had to put the stove on the passage. So we had, the women has to cook on the passage with one or two stove. Mm -hmm. And when they came in from work, oh, it was tremendous, really seeing the, the going from the room to the mm -hmm. passage they have to wash in the room wash and bring the thing to the passage and cook it was very 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 hard those days well, that sounds very difficult hard. what about uh use of bathrooms and things like that was there was shared bathrooms there was bathroom but there there was no hot water and um some of the houses have no heating whatsoever. It was very difficult. So I understood you had to go to public baths, is that right? Yes, every Friday <laughs> we had to go to the public bath. All oh, those days it was so cold and the, the fog was so tremendous. And when you go to the bath, you have 13 pieces of clothes to take off and 13 pieces to put back on. It was, it was really a hard time. That does, that sounds tough. So you had all of those layers on to keep warm. Yeah, you well, had 13 pieces of clothes to keep clothes warm. Clothes to keep you warm. keep you warm. Okay, so Norman, tell us a bit about um, work, because, you know, you heard that the streets were paved with gold. Were they paved with gold when you arrived here? Or did there you have There was to go no to work? gold. I was looking good to see if I see any, but I did not see none. But one thing, when we came, the streets were asphalt, and the asphalt was so thick that when the summertime, the tar want to melt. Mm. So they had to add sprinkler and sprinkling the street to keep it cool. So the winters were very cold and were the summers very hot? Hot, yes. The summers were very hot. Yes, yes. So Norman, tell us about work. Um, how did you find work? So there's no gold, how did you find work? The Monday, Monday I went and I signed on at uh, in London mm -hmm. and after signing on I one of my friends that I met at the home he said come with me tomorrow morning I think they need a man so we went and when I went in the morning they take me on 
and then I started to work. And then the Thursday, we st I started the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday we were loading a lorry with three men on one side, three on the other. We were, they were Irish men with myself. And um, <clears throat> one brick from my side went over the other side and hit a man in his head. <laughs> and he hailed out. And then they took him to the first aid. So the other foreman says, it's my brick. <laughs> they said it was your brick that hit yes, the man in the head. They all say it's my brick. So, because they were brothers, <laughs> yeah, mm. maybe. And, um, on Thursday, that was Thursday, Friday morning, when I go in about 12 o'clock, the foreman came to me and said, you are finished. So you were fired? <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know what he meant when he said, I'm finished. But an African man was there, and he works around and come to me and said, what did the foreman say to you? He said, I'm finished. He said, you know what he meant? I said, no. He mean that you lose your job. Oh, Why wow. did he suck you then? <laughs> anyway, really. And four o'clock, he came and gave me an envelope. So when he gave me the envelope, I said to him, can I wait for my friend? He said, no, get off the premises. You're finished. So you had to leave. So I had was to leave and make my way home. So you really then had a job for about three or four days. That was your first job for three or four That's days. That's my first day. My first job. Only three days to work in. Okay. She was the so, so Four Norm days. So Norman, you had a number of different jobs though, didn't you? What were some of the other jobs well, that you did? I got an another job a week after. And that was piling. And I did love that job. That job only lost me four days, one week, eight one days, week. eight days, eight days, eight days. I was very disappointed because it was very interesting, but um, I just have to go again, and then I went to the railway. I got, and um, it takes me a little circle to get around and to get to Watford. And then the, f the station master took me on and I worked four weeks. Two after the four weeks, he sent me to get my medical. When I went, they, f they failed me, said, I have short sight. <laughs> You were short-sighted? <laughs> yes, I was short-sighted. So I had to come back and then I get two week notice and I work the other two weeks out and um, I lose that job again. So after a week, I went to Park Royal at a glass factory and um, when I went, there was 13 men waiting to see if they can get a job. So after the personal officer took on a few, he came back and he said, gentlemen, I'm sorry, but there's no more vacants this morning. So all the men shoot and went, I said, you know what happens? I am waiting, I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> so when they are gone, I still stand there a little after. He looks out and he saw me, he said, don't go away. <laughs> wow, so you stayed, the other 12 went, you stayed? Yes, I stayed. And did you and get the job? Yes, I got the job that morning and um, he asked me if I wanted to start now. I told him, no, my card was at the exchange, so I would like to go to the exchange to collect it. He said, you can go and collect it and come back and start to work. Fantastic. But um, I insist on him to let me go and get the card, then I'll come in on Tuesday morning. Mm. 
And he said, all right, come and wait for me right here. So I went back. I went and get my card and on Tuesday morning I went to work. Then he came in, he called me. And there I got my job. And I worked there nine years and six months. Nine years and six months. So, so Norman, you had lots of short jobs. Uh, then you had this job that you spoke about for nine years. But you also worked for 12 years for the St John's Ambulance Brigade. Yes. Um, now, <laughs> it takes me a little to get into this St. John's Avenue. One of my brother-in-law came up and unfortunately he had a dream that somebody running after him. So he take his fist and <laughs> hit after him and he hit through the glass. Mm -hmm. And then his hands were all cut up. So the night I was trembling when he came in and knocked my door and said, his hand is bleeding. And then I had to take him to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, so after that, I didn't have no idea of first aid or any knowledge what I could do to help him. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go and um, learn first aid at the St. John's Brigade. Mm -hmm. And um, after working with them, then I, the supervisor told me that I should take a course also in nursing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I does that. And then I became a, a first aider. First aider. <laughs> and then, um, I stayed with the St. John's Brigade for 12 years, going around to different places, doing um, what you call it, um, first aid. First aid. Yes. And um, I've been to the theaters, I've been to the football ground, and all of different places. But Norman, you've always been somebody who's been interested in the welfare of other people and looking after other people. So you went on to set up WISCO. Tell us what WISCO is. Well, WISCO, I have um, been looking around and see a few of our people getting stroke. They are on the road, hopping and walking for women. I said, but well, these people need some help. And um, it came to me that I should start this club. And what does WISCO stand for? WISCO stands for West Indian Senior Citizen Organization. So I went and um, around few of the roads and invite some folks to come because I want to start an organization. On the night we plan to meet, the 27th night of um, November, mm -hmm. 1980, um, I had 13 people at the home and we planned the organization. We set it off, we make, we select officers, we do everything. And um, we plan how much we should take for um, membership and, um, and things like that. And we get this organization and we started to have meeting every first Monday in the month. So every first Monday of the month. What sort of things were you doing? What did you do at WISCO? So after two years, we running in my house. I um, went and I get a church hall and then after going to the church hall we plan and start up a club and in the club that we start up we have a, read, a clause for those who could not read then we have drawing we have keep fit clause we have cushion, we have knitting, we have discussion, and uh, 
a lot of things goes on. We have outing, we have concerts. Our and I understand, Norma, that you were the one that did all the cooking, is that right? Yes, and uh, well, with the cooking, we, I have to do the shopping, I have to season up the meat, I have to do the everything towards the club. And where did the money come from for you to do all of this? Well, the money comes from my pack. When I go to shopping, I do like, I just buy home things and buy for the club too. And, um, so all of this we, money came from We you? had, we get some seeds, but the seeds we get if, in case that we had somebody to help in any capacity, they ask what that person does and blah, blah, and they give us a little money and we can't use the money to do anything but to pay that person maybe mm. for a little time. But paying those days, it may be six shillings now, something like mm. that. How long did Wisco run for? Well, this year, 2020, 27th of November will be 40 years. 40 years? Yes. That's amazing, 40 years. So Norman, actually something else quite phenomenal is going to be happening on the 27th of December. <laughs> What's happening on the 27th of December? Well, on the 27th of December this year, I'll be running up a hundred years. You are going to be a hundred years old. You look phenomenal. Your memory is amazing. Yes. And you are so happy. This is a great look for a hundred, you know, right? This is a great look for a hundred. So Norman, you uh, received a very special award, didn't you? For all of your hard work. What was the award that you received? Well, the award, the award that I had is from the community work that I does. I um, I work for Crossroads also mm -hmm. for three years doing caring, and I took care of a lot of men, and um, all involved in this community work in are getting my award mm -hmm. and um, and this was in 2013. So you first received an award from Brent Council didn't you? I have for, also an yeah. award from Brent, more than one. Mm. I had more than one from Brent Council because I think they were in poem of what I was doing and helping the people that was mm. in need. I worked in the community to do a lot of help to in funeral, weddings, and um, engagement. And engagement. <laughs> so you've done weddings, funerals, <laughs> engagement, you did first aid. And eventually you were awarded an MBE. Yes, I, I was. When did you receive your MBE? 2014. 2014? 2014. 2014. Yes. Wow. So you've now got an MBE. Norman, what do you, um, what do you think about the Windrush scandal? So you've spoken about the fact that you came to the UK many years ago, that you worked, you found it difficult to have housing, but you contributed to the country. So what do you think about yourself and all of the others uh, well, who came over and the Windrush scandal? What do you think about that? Well, with the Windrush, a lot of people make mistakes while some their papers was lost. Mm. But um, in the Windrush, when it comes, you hear that you are to take up your um, registered mm -hmm. as British subject. So a lot of people 
did not respond to that and because of that it caused a lot of problems in mm. the later days but um if they did considered it out and do the right thing then perhaps we would not have so many mistakes what do you think about the fact that people were deported what do you think should happen with that do you think that was fair i i was very sorry over that reporting business i was not very happy and um it was my desire to see the people them that really deported if they could get the privilege to be back in the UK seeing that their works and their pension and their working gone in vain of which when you think it out they should be able to have the pleasure of enjoying what they work for absolutely absolutely so that made you very sad that yes. you know as a people we've contributed uh, to the economy and that we would be sent back uh, to our places of, of yes. origin norman what would you um say to a young person now that lives in the UK? What would you say to a young person, especially young black individuals? What might you say to them? What advice I, might you I give? always encourage them that they should listen to their senior because the senior always knows a little more than they know. And so they made a lot of mistakes. They don't listen to our seniors, but we should, and then we would grow up more understanding. Nice. So you think the young people should listen to uh, listen to their elders, because as elders, you've made the mistakes and you've learned from that. Yes, of and you course we should. That on yeah, them. Of course. What's your favourite place in the UK? Well, living from Forest Hill, coming down to Paddington to House then. Well, we're um, at house then. I'm now there for 60 odd years. And um, I find it very comfortable. And around that space, the people are very kind hearted and we move in harmony. So I'm quite comfortable. So you quite like Harlesden. Yes. You talk about harmony. There was some harmony back in the day though, wasn't there, Norman? How did you socialise back in the day as a group of people that came to the UK? How did you socialise? What did you do? We, sometimes we said good morning and um, we try, I tried to make people laugh anyway when I meet them on the road. I said, how are you this morning? <laughs> You're very so, bubbly. So that, that makes, give them a smile. And um, I get along with them all right so far. How did you get together? What things did you do for entertainment? Well, in those days, we had social sometimes. And when the kids, then we have the birthday parties and christening parties and that keeps the time going and mm. everybody get happy at that nice and you also spoke quite fondly about uh men getting together and playing dominoes tell me a bit about that well in the early days there was nowhere to go so the men always have a choice where black houses they always have a room together and to play domino and to play cards and then if the lady came along with them if they have one then the lady would sit down or she would join in with them and then they love their baby shandos days and 
Cherry B. <laughs> <laughs> so the men will be playing dominoes and the women and will be drinking champagne baby, and cherry baby B. Baby Sham and, and Cherry B. <laughs> baby Sham and Cherry B. Fantastic. I like that. So talking about um, entertainment and music and having a good time, uh, you have a very famous daughter. Yes. You are the father of Liz Mitchell from Boney M, the lead singer from Boney M. That's right. <laughs> How fabulous is that? So what's that like, having a very famous daughter? Oh, she started just in a simple way. Um, we had some business was going down in the 60s and uh, started there to begin to sing and then she traveled away to Germany where she makes her a single single and um, and then she made the, the song by the rivers up Babylon. Oh wow, that was a big <laughs> that hit. That was it? a very big hit. And it hits. I remember in my factory, I was working at that, right? Every day almost that record is being played in throughout the whole factory. Wow. By the rivers of Babylon where we start. And everybody calling Michi! That yeah. must have been Here amazing. Your daughter. <laughs> it, it was exciting. Oh, I love that. That's yes. fantastic. So Norman, you've taken us on a real journey of arriving in the UK. You've spoken about the fruit that you could access so easily, um, you know, when you were back home in Clarendon. You spoke about the, you know, the death of your father when you were just 14 and, you know, how you took care of your mum. You spoke about how you've come to the UK to look for the paved gold that wasn't to be found and how your bed was so small that you had to stand up uh, to turn over. You've really, really taken us on a journey. One of the things you told me about was um, how you were impacted by racism. There was a time when whilst working, you were saying that often women were sent home early. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, during the 60s, 50s, 60s, the fog used to come down. Oh, one week we have the fog every day or evening. And um, when it comes down, you cannot see no one. You only hear feet walking. So when the ladies used to work, in the factories or canteens, the managers used to send them home early because of the trouble with the teddy boys. So get them out from work that they can get home in time before the fog comes mm. down or it get down. Yes. Wow. It was it was very difficult those days, but we make it true. So Norman, uh, you came to the UK by boat, but you actually really, really enjoy traveling. Tell me some of the places you've traveled to. My first place that I traveled to was France. And then from France, I went to Holland, Belgium, Germany, different places is in Germany, um, Turkey, um, Italy, um, Cyprus, Spain, then I went to Jerusalem, went to Bethlehem, Nazareth, um, Travel all around the course. Um, You've also been to Gambia and Zimbabwe, haven't you? I went to Gambia and I went to Zimbabwe several times. Wow. Which is your favorite place 
of all of those places. I love Zimbabwe. You love Zimbabwe. Beautiful place, lovely place, the people are nice. Very, 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 very kind-hearted. I had one of my in-laws <laughs> take take me to his farm on Christmas, give me a sheep for my Christmas holiday. A sheep? <laughs> yeah. Wow. We had sheep meat all day. They gave me chicken. Oh, I have chicken. I couldn't <laughs> eat all the chicken. I have to leave chicken in Zimbabwe. But the first time I've been there, very exciting. A chicken was presented to me by the mother because when they had a visitor, the visitor must get that chicken and we have, have, have him and then kill and then we eat that chicken the following wow. Sunday. It was very exciting. Very, very much so, you know. So Zimbabwe is your favourite place yes. to travel? Yes. Okay, super. Fantastic. Well, Norman, we've discussed the fact that in a few weeks you're going to be a ripe 100 years old. How have you managed to keep so healthy and to look so well and to have such amazing memory? <laughs> what is your secret? <laughs> well, my secret, I believe and trust God. <laughs> Believe in and yourself. one of the things that we should have is love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, think it no harm, is not easily provoked. Think it no harm. Love one another with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. Thank you. Oh, Norman, thank you so much for joining me on Patricia Talks. It has been my absolute pleasure, and I'm looking forward to the next 100 years that you have to offer us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe our channel.